You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by Russell Investments, home of Russell Indexes, which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities. Approximately $4.1 trillion in assets are benchmarked to the Russell Indexes. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. And now it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Quite a few programs for you to choose from, for you to dial through on the old network, including well over 100 archived episodes of this here program, Volatility View. Where can you find all of that volatility goodness? Well, of course, the easiest place is just head on over to the website, theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the Insider Radio Network tab, and you're pretty much off to the races, of course, while you're there. Click on some unusual activity, maybe read some breaking news from the options market, some education, basic, intermediate, or advanced. Wherever you fall on the spectrum, chances are we got something for you. And then, of course, all that radio goodness. If you're just hardcore for the radio, well, of course, you can find it. iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, pretty much wherever you find your favorite programs, including we baked it all in to our mobile app there available for iOS, Android, and indeed the ever-growing Fire OS. I think we've gotten a few questions actually from Fire OS users. So I know you're out there. You do exist. Uh, all right. So check it out pretty much on whatever platform you like. And while you're doing so, make sure uh, if you like it or if you don't, or if you have a question or a comment, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. No shortage of ways for you guys to do just that. And a lot of that also is baked into the mobile app to make things that much easier for you. And joining me on the old Volatility Views program again this week, my volatility compatriot, my partner in crime, the evil yin to my light side yang, <laughs> the greasy meatball himself, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Greasy Meatball, welcome back to the Volatility Views program. Good to be here. Another great day. Another uh, another S and P meltdown. Yes, it seems like it's just it's just par for the course at this point. Oh, another day S and P off one and a half percent. Eh, what else you got? <laughs> yeah, it's not that exciting to me anymore. No, no, our frame of reference over the past few weeks has certainly, certainly changed. And also joining us, our special guest stars for the episode, uh, return friends of the program. We have Matt and Mike Thompson. They're the co-founders, chief investment officers. Call them what you will. They are the major domos over there at Typhon Capital Management. Matt and Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. Well, we're happy to have you on. We have a very specific reason we wanted to bring you back on this week, because something up right now that falls very much into your wheelhouse. I think we'll dive right into it. Without further ado, let's keep on rolling right on into our volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, 
everybody. Welcome to the Volatility Review. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down the week that was from a volatility perspective and indeed the week that is currently ongoing. As Mark alluded to, we are recording this on Friday, September 4th, right around the middle of the session, about halfway through, and most of the major indices in pretty aggressive sell-off mode. Uh, the S&P off 1.6% as we are recording this. The Dow a little bit worse, about 1.7%. So closing in on 2% off in the Dow. And of course, uh, the Q's actually a bit of a lagger today, only off 1.3%. Usually they seem to be leading the charge uh, a lot these days. And surprise, surprise, with all this red on the screen, Got some green in VIX land, in particular the VIX cash up about 2.8 handles right now, hovering right around the uh, 28 half level or so. And all for all of you percent of percent fans out there, about 11, not, almost about 11 percent uh, on the day. I can see Mike. It's not a video show, listeners, but I can see Mark's face turning red uh, already. But there was a lot to go on. But before we even do that, um, you know, Mark, you and I were. Only, we weren't really joking last week. We were serious, of course, but it was a bit of a, uh, shall we say, a bit of a leap of logic for you and I both to come out and say, yeah, you know, I think rational calmer heads would say the VIX should be lower next week, but there's a lot of, to use a technical term, a lot of wonkiness afoot out there. And it does seem to be pointing to the fact that we may indeed be higher at this point next week. And lo and behold, we were indeed right. We are indeed a couple of handles higher, as I recall here in the VIX cash than we were at the close of the show last week. So does that surprise you that our relatively outlandish prediction came to pass no and and honestly i think we we derived that a lot from the vix futures and you know the vix futures are up a lot more than the vix cash is on the week and we've seen that, that you know i think mike and matt are gonna have some cool things to talk about when when we look at, at how the curve has moved the last couple of weeks because this has been a you know there's some things that you know i've never seen i watched the way the vix moved in 08 and 11 and this is definitely a completely different move from it's not i mean there's there's comparisons that can be be made to both of those and also comparisons that can't and so uh yeah you know vix looks like it it th things look like they're going to keep going and everything that that the volatility in indexes are saying is the market is in duress and uh we may head further south from here well, Matt and Mike, as he alluded to, uh, the reason we did want to bring you back on the show, not that we don't like having you on all the time, but uh, there seems a lot cooking in your wheelhouse these days, you guys over there at Typhon. Uh, do spend a lot of time uh, trading or sometimes not trading <laughs> the VIX term structure in the futures, depending on how it's lining up. And uh, it's certainly lining up interestingly, I think, uh, <laughs> to say the least, uh, this week. So you guys are our diehard, diehard VIX futures term structure watchers. I think we'll get into that, but maybe even before we get into that structure, the term structure, why don't you go ahead and give us kind of your take on what the last few weeks have been like for you in terms of, uh, you know, your reactions to the extreme volatility that we've seen in the stream market movements. And then we can get into uh, what is, I think, to be ter termed accurately and definitively a, a very wonky uh, term structure out there in the VIX futures. <clears throat> Yeah, definitely a uh, sort of tale of two markets, right? Um, beginning of August was pretty placid. I think spot closed uh, with a 10 handle one day in August. And then uh, all of a sudden, post the Chinese currency devaluation, I think that uh, sent some macro shocks through the entire marketplace. And we saw a dramatic shift uh, starting August 20th. Um, the term structure went pretty flat for us. And for us, that's kind of our, our yellow amber warning light, if you will, a flat term structure. You know, so that, that got us out of the market back on August 20th, and then everyone knows what's happened since then. And it, it's been, uh, you know, shades of 2011, kind of with the side of flash crash thrown in there. <clears throat> so it's been a very interesting market. You know, you can't necessarily pinpoint kind of one pressure point. There is no Greek vote up or down uh, that's really bothering the market. It's kind of uh, what we call, you know, macro brush fires that have kind of combined into a uh, full-on conflagration. Oh, conflagration? Yeah. Sebastian Wait. just passed out when I used that word. <laughs> conflagration. We might, um, we might have a title for our episode, The Vix Conflagration. Uh, yeah, I, you know, the transition into the, the back of the curve that we saw starting, you know, um, on Monday was, I would say, reasonably typical. What kind of caught our eye definitely and caught everyone's eye was the speed once once it kind of finally broke you know and i mean the market literally broke on monday morning 
with, with stuff um, halted down and the, the VIX index wasn't calculated for half an hour. I mean, that was that was uh, that was beyond um, uh, you know the reaction that we've we've been used to, um, even in the VIX futures. And, and since then, what we've noticed is that the, the curve is backward, like it is, like it always is during um, stress periods. What we're looking at is the you know sixth, seventh, eighth month VIX future starting to buy into it recently. You know, they're up um, trading in the 23s, 24s. That's that's a little bit more to us. That's um, you know VIX is buying into it. This may last a while. Yeah, I think that's the interesting part of this because you know let's just we'll walk it back a little bit for people who aren't uh, knee deep in in the VIX futures term structure. You know, in a typical aggressive sell off like we saw last week on Monday, and of course the resulting halt in the VIX options and all the the chaos that was unfolding on on the Monday of last week. You know, in those types of environments, you expect to see the VIX futures become referred to as backward, of course, which is just getting a, a severe bid to the near term of the term structure because quite frankly, no one knows what the hell is going on. No. No one knows what is up, so that front portion is going to get bid out of all all control, and that's kind of how the product works. Uh, typically, that'll come off relatively quickly once that whatever near-term aberration has washed itself out of the mix, and things will get back to normal. If things get to last a little bit longer, then as we're seeing now, as things start to creep in to uh, the longer term, and that is perhaps a more interesting development because that, like they were just referring to, shows that perhaps... Uh, there is a little bit more buy-in from the marketplace, that there perhaps is some more structural changes afoot there in the marketplace, that this volatility uh, may be around for a little bit longer period uh, than some people may have expected. And I think it sounds like you guys, Matt and Mike, that's when you guys really start to take uh, what's going on out here in the marketplace a little bit more seriously because, shall we say, uh, not to call the near term of the VIX the less serious money, but the, the deep Deep, serious money, perhaps starting to buy into this ball a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely um, you know caught our attention, and you know our our process has had its long volatility for as long as um, you know we, we were long for eight days in a row, which you know we've been trading our product for four years, and we've not seen a long signal last that long. Um, so you know it's it's coming through in our in the data, and um, you know we saw a move. You know the VIX moved similar to this back in October 2014. And I think the eighth month future never got above maybe 21. So, you know, just a big difference. You know, we, we saw the, the front of the term structure do similar things to what it's doing now, but it came right back off uh, back then. This is not doing that, so. Yeah, any hope for a V bottom seems to be V disappearing. Yeah. Upside down V. Yeah, I, I mean, this is looking more like a W or maybe a V with, another v below it or you know some certainly not looking looking it looks like an l with a v in it maybe um <laughs> an alphabet correction they yeah it is not n nothing about what i'm looking at says you know that this is going to end quickly um the whole vix structure is on top of itself and it's just that back end of the curve stuff is just i i it, it's beyond me we were sitting around kind of talking about it could be related to like a big huge variance trade that went up or you know some long fall play but um yeah i mean the fact that what was that was that last friday that 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 the um it's like february and march were, were outperforming september or something like that i mean yeah. and and on some volume so i, I don't know i'm, I'm not i'm confused i'm i'm like mark faber i'm confused I think you need to call somebody, Mark. <laughs> uh, is that Garvin or Favor? Either of those guys. Uh, um, but you, you know, know, it's it's just hilarious. I there's the only thing that's annoying about these sell-offs is the guys that said the market was done at seventeen and fifty are out there saying how right they were. Hundred seventy, you know, two hundred point, two hundred point still in the red. And um, you know, that is that is one thing I would say is kind of hilarious. Uh, you know, kind of a, kind of puts the lie to what we were talking about uh, on Option Block just a, a few episodes ago, Mark, about how uh, the big uh, Goldman Research Report thinking uh, that saying that structurally VIX should be much lower, and that I think it was a very specific amount. It, it was exactly two handles that it should be lower. And so, yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> Goldman, the VIX is, the VIX is two points too high. 
<laughs> I've, yeah, never seen, I've never seen that much specificity in my life. <laughs> it was fantastic and also fantastically absurd. And of course, we're seeing uh, the proof of that in the pudding right now. Uh, but getting back to the VIX futures for a second, you know, it is kind of a bit of a, a strange turnaround, Matt and Mike, since the last time you guys were on the show, last time you were on the show, I think a few months ago, you guys were talking about how kind of like you were saying, the VIX futures term structure kind of flat. You guys have a very specific uh, shape you like to see uh, before you start trading it. So you guys were kind of sitting on your hands. In fact, we were we were talking about were you starting to look farther afield at other products, maybe maybe even some of uh, the V stocks and things like that, because there was just nothing afoot at all that was worth trading in the VIX futures land. And then lo and behold, not that long after a month or two, and all of a sudden you have this what for your guys, your signal is a historically long a buy signal. So kind of a bit of a uh, of a complete 180. You guys are probably uh, more busy than you know what to do with right now. Yeah, it's definitely presenting a, you know, a target rich environment, uh, a volatile market, obviously, but it is, you know, night and day from kind of the doldrums of uh, early summer. There was some trade around the whole Greek debacle uh, end of June, beginning of July. Well, this is completely different feel to it. You know, whatever's bothering the market, the market's having a tough time placing where it's going to, uh, you know, become acute. And I think that's why you see a bid in the whole term structure. And I don't, I don't want you guys to give away the secret sauce, obviously, because you guys do a lot of stuff over there at Typhon. But when you say uh, a buy signal is being generated by the term structure right now, is that just a straight up as simple as it sounds buying of the of the near term contract? Or is it some sort of specific buy signal where you have a specific spread in the term structure you think is is more attractive right now than normal? What does that translate into for our typical listener out there? Oh, yeah, this interview's over. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I mean, nothing, nothing is as easy as, like, a, you know, a single um, trip or trigger. It's a combination of kind of price momentum and the, the shape of the VIX futures term structure. And when we express a position, it's generally um, a basket of VIX futures. You know, it's not uh, just buy front month and, <clears throat> and ride it. Because there is, you know, consideration of the uh, spread between where cash fix is, where front month is, how far to expiration are we. But, uh, you know, in general, the, the term structure is the most important component that goes into our uh, positions. Yeah, I didn't think you guys were out there willy nilly recommending you jump in and buy, buy the front month fixed future. That would be an interesting trade right now, I think, uh, if that yeah. were indeed the case. Right, it's like a bucking bronco. Yes, that would be throwing people quite uh, quite literally to the wolves in this case uh, yeah so we use a basket of uh you know we do use some front month that position decreases as we get closer to expiration you know and use second month and we do use some of the deferred months when we're spreading um so you know, it, it's a, a collection of mixed futures it's not just front month and Mark just alluded to it. There has been a lot of talk about what has been driving uh, this kind of aberrant term structure we're seeing. Uh, you know, there is uh, talk, you know, it could just be the longer term, cl- you know, clientele buying in. But it wasn't even a straight up just a bid to Dece, kind of like Mark referred to. There was there were weird pockets of bids popping up there throughout the term structure. I think February for a while, others were just catching bids in weird amounts and certainly with a lot of volume. Uh, did you did you catch wind that anything was indeed being unwound? Because that seemed to be uh, the assumption a lot of people were holding of something upstairs, variants or otherwise, was being put on or unwound and done to some significant size, and we were seeing that reflected in, in the VIX futures. Is that something you, you were able to ferret out in your various investigations? Yeah, you know, I think the most obvious one, and this is more for the front uh, two months, but the uh, Commitment of Traders report swung from a you know, decent uh, net short position to a long position, so you saw some of that mechanical short covering in the front end of the curve you know nothing solid that we heard on a like a big variance trade going up but the back end of the curve would be be about the right time you know for a typical uh, variance trade maybe even on the shorter end you know <clears throat> saw some complimentary S&P put buying you know way out of the money that could be squaring off a very a short variance book from a dealer so there's uh you know hints of that but obviously no one's going to kind of float that out there uh, in plain vanilla public information. Yeah, Goldman just announced. So oh, yeah, we took uh, we took four vol points from a customer on <laughs> on eight on on a billion Vega, and then just dumped it off in the in the futures curve. 
That, we, that sounds like something Goldman would do. While we were talking down Vix by exactly two points, we were taking it on the other side. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Vix I mean, is too were, cheap. By the way, Mark, <laughs> there were some ridiculous things out of Zero Hedge over the weekend. Now, I know... You know, everything there is a conspiracy, but they put out some post on Friday You're talking night. talking about the gamma hedging stuff? Uh, well, no, it was about uh, it was about how VXX the, was clearly gamed so that they could tank it. Uh, I didn't and, see that. I know we talked a lot recently. A lot of, a lot of people wrote in to us with the, uh, the gamma hedging one and how much impact that has on the market, which actually— It can it, be big. For, for Zero Hedge was one of their more, I think— uh, com articles it actually was pretty much mostly right it seemed like to me yeah uh, no they, they came up with this at last friday uh you know at the end of the day vix had been kind of bid all day even though the market wasn't selling off very much you know you and i were kind of wrapping up the show talking about vix being bid market not off very much so at the end of the day the market rallied to a little bit up and a bunch of guys took off their long ball for the weekend and zero hedges off with some article about how they're rigging vxx and and you know, with the, with the amount of, of study that you guys look at at VXX, do you think – how difficult do you think would be to, to rig the VXX settlement? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it would take quite a lot of firepower, and that, that tail's not going to wag the dog for too long. I think you'd have a pirate victory there if you uh, mm -hmm. looked to pound vol just through the VIX futures. You know, it's going to come back at you. The, the, the vol our guys would pick up on that pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, one of the other things we're hearing, I'm sure the Marks have heard this too, is, you know, there was a big ball seller in the market last year who they changed managers, if I can say it that way, and they don't employ that strategy to as great a degree for their um, their income funds. So that could be some of the reason why, you know, the back end of the curve was bid up uh, as much this time because that seller is not there anymore. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a sizable seller, a, a VIX whale, if you will. You know, it's funny, getting back to the Zero Hedge for a second, you know, I, I like that site, uh, <clears throat> but you got to kind of know what you're getting when you go over there. The, the people are posting under names like Tyler Durden, so they're not really, it's not like, you know, Walter Cronkite level of, of journalism. They're, 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 they find some interesting nuggets, I will certainly give them that, but they also have been known to, uh, you know, throw the occasional a bomb in the room and then walk out and then enjoy uh, the, the carnage that they have sown there. So they, they do like to uh, venture into tinfoil hat territory. I didn't see the VXX one, uh, but I did, like I said, the gamma scalping one was interesting. And yeah, they do uh, they do throw some interesting things out there. We get a lot of email from people, hey, what about this? What about that? And that's, that's exactly what they want. They're out there kind of trying to stir the pot out there. And a lot of times they're right. Sometimes they're a little bit uh, a tin foily. <laughs> this one sounds like I haven't had a chance to read it, so I don't know. But sounds like it was leaning a little bit uh, tin foil. We see this a lot whenever we hear these, you know, um, <clears throat> tail wagging the dog things. There are a lot of ways that these ETPs do relate back into the big VIX and the big S and P in some interesting ways. But you know, in terms of moving a thing like VXX, which is on some days uh, the exchange volume leader in terms of products, the, the amount of muscle that would take. Uh, and capital is is so enormous. Uh, and I think you're right. I think I think the returns on that, whatever whatever minimum, whatever short lived gain you had from that, once the market realized what was up, uh, you would you would take it on the other end pretty 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 bad, and it would be uh, leave a mark, let's say. Yeah. Well, you know, there's tinfoil hats when it's a literally a picture with a circle that says WTF. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I gave a webinar yesterday and. And to a few hundred people about VIX and stuff like that. And trying to explain to people that, you know, now is not the time to sit there and think XIV has to go up because vol's high. Um, you know, I, I try and explain to people that, yes, XIV generally is going higher, but there are periods of time where all it's doing is working against you. So then they're like, well, what do we do? How do I get, what if I want to get, uh, what if I want to get short vol? I go, wait till the future curve flattens. And then do something. And if you really are that firm, I need to catch the bottom by calls in SVXY. That's something you can do. And actually, there, if there's been a beneficiary of, of this move in that space, it's been SVXY. Option volume is way up in that name. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah that, those names have really uh, done pretty well. I've, I've been looking at some of the numbers out there of late, not even on the option side, just in the, uh, the net uh, underlying contract, SVXY. 
uh, picking up about over uh, over half a billion uh, in inflows, uh, which is a lot for that name, which has about now about 600 million under assets and assets under management. So that, that was a substantial gain uh, for a, uh, a short term futures product like SBXY. Another uh, levered one a lot of people like to play around in is, of course, uh, XIV. That one a little bit more uh, well known, perhaps a little bit more established. That one took in over a billion, 1.1 billion uh, since in the, just in the last about two weeks. So since all of this really started popping off, uh, the inverse funds and inverse products have been uh, lighting it up. I haven't had a chance to dive into their options volume, but I'd imagine uh, if the underlying is doing that well, then uh, it's got to be commensurate options volume out there. Anything uh, catching your eye from a specific options trade mark, or is it all pretty much uh, one-sided out there? Uh, in terms of the trading, I mean, it's it's actually been there's been a ton of September put buying, which has been odd, and some October put buying. So you've got a lot of people that are I think are you've got a lot of kind of two way action, maybe even net short kind of at the money, and then lots of people jockeying for a movie that are a lot lower or a lot higher. So we've seen I would say a lot of people you know taking on you know moving hedges. So the guys that, are, that have been long all those 30 calls have been taking money and moving them out. So we maybe have even seen net short sellers of, you know, at the 25, 26, 27, and 30 strikes in September and October. Uh, but against that, we've seen lots of 19 and 18 put buying and 35, 40 the one call. one by twos. Yeah. On the put side. Yeah, you know, lots of one by, yeah, put one by twos, call one by twos. So lots of flow uh, moving things around for sure. Speaking of flow, getting it all back to uh, the the mothership there, the VIX futures where we started it all. Uh, surprise, surprise! Uh, the numbers are out for August, and August was uh, let's say a good month to be in, in the VIX business, and particularly the VIX futures business. It was the second busiest month of all time. Yeah, surprise! Some people might thought it might have been the number one month, but I think the the fact that uh, the things started lighting off so late in August, if it had happened a week or two earlier, it certainly would have been. Uh, the busiest month of all time, uh, third consecutive monthly gain for uh, the CFE over there, the CBOE Futures Exchange, of course, uh, ADV up 34 percent just from the month ahead of time, just from July and up nearly 50 uh, percent, 40 odd percent uh, from August, the same period last year. Now, not surprising, I guess, because August typically a pretty quiet month. So when you're comparing last summer's kind of doldrums to this year's rocking and rolling, it's going to be a pretty big jump. Uh, but still, that is uh, those are impressive numbers, uh, despite uh, despite pretty much how you look at it. Total volume for August in VIX uh, in VIX futures land was 6.4 million contracts. That's up uh, 28 percent and about, again about 41 percent from uh, August the year before, 28 percent from the previous July. And so 6.4 million contracts, Matt and Mike, you guys were what, about one and a half million of that? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was a while ago. <laughs> at, least, at least one and a half, if not two. <laughs> Just under that. <laughs> uh, also, some action, as you might expect, out there in, uh, in the old VIX options land. It's been a relatively busy week, not perhaps as crazy as it was last week when we were pushing uh, close to 2 million contracts some days, but getting pretty close this week uh, with uh, coming in on the first with about 1.5 million contracts, that kind of being the, the, uh, the busiest day, seems like, uh, of, the, of the week, then about 800,000 on two, um, excuse me, on, on the second, and then uh, yesterday, Thursday, about 1.1, the third, 1.1 million contracts. And so far uh, today, given the fact that we are once again in aggressive sell-off mode, I think the market, kind of like we were jokingly referring to it, at the top of the show, uh, market is kind of feeling like, yeah, we, we've been there, done that. We've seen this before now. Not as panicked as it was, shall we say, in the first the teeth of the initial sell-off back last uh, Monday or Monday a week and a half ago now where we're only doing about 300-some-odd thousand contracts right now. Halfway through the day in the big VIX product when we're off, the sell-off is uh, steepening as we speak down near 1.8% right now in the S&P. So not seeing that volume really... Uh, reflected so far in the in the overall VIX options. Perhaps it will pick up at the end of the day. Of course, we had non-farms this morning, so a lot of people were waiting for that, that helping to keep, uh, keep the VIX somewhat elevated throughout the week, even though we had a couple of days uh, of successive rallies. There still was this one potential pain point at the end of the week, and we joked about it earlier in the year how non-farms 
not really that big of a deal. All of a sudden, non-farms are coming something of a big deal. And so people are starting to keep their powder dry again the way they used to back in the old days going into uh, going into non-farms. And now, of course, with this sell-off, people are a little bit reticent to hit some bids in vol, and we're catching uh, catching some wind fixed cash lurking near 29 now as we speak. Uh, Mark, like I said, it's been a kind of an active week across the board. VIX futures, VIX options, uh, related products, XIV, VXY, VXX, pretty much all lighten it up. Uh, across the board. VXX ADV uh, was about uh, 377,000 contracts coming into this. And now this week, most days doing well over 600,000. So VXX options lighten it up this week as well. Anything else in that slew of volatility activity really, uh, really catch your eye this week and anything else lighten it up over there with your mentees in the pit chat? Well, I think volume is volumes lightening up a little bit because, you know, the VIX is now in a little bit of a range for a while. Um, if it makes a breakout above 35 and really trades there, because I mean, think about it, like the, it traded above 35 for, you know, what, nine hours, something like that. You know, we could we could see volume really, really pick up. What I feel like right now is people are positioned now so that so things have been set up. That's what's going to cause the volume to slow down uh, the next leg down. So here we are about 1917. The lows were what 1862 or something like that in the in the cash and somewhere around 1860 in the spoos. If those break, we could see we could see VIX make a very quick, very aggressive up, upward move, and volume will will spike again. Yeah, who knows? You might be poised for uh, <laughs> poised for uh, some more aggressive upside. And again, you know, we said it last week, and we were only half joking, but it seemed like a lot was. We, we don't want to spoil the crystal ball, but uh, but it seemed like a lot was pointing to more rough waters ahead, and it seems like we're heading that way as well. Uh, before we wrap up the volatility review, uh, let's dive into another product that's been uh, been catching a lot of people's eyes of late and I know has been a, a big talking point for us, particularly earlier in the year before the equities started catching up and, and getting some volatility of their own. That is, of course, uh, crude oil it was an interesting end to last week start to this week where we saw crude pretty much in rally mode about three straight sessions saw most of the two major products pretty much uh up about oh roughly uh short covering rally as well about up to about close to 10 bucks a barrel uh, depending on where you looked at them there then of course come into tuesday we got some data coming out of china that uh curtailed uh, some of that rally, and as we're coming into the end of this week here on Friday, uh, we're seeing a WTI hovering right south of 47, about 46.75, and about 50 half in the Brent. So Brent back up over that uh, pivotal 50 handle, and WTI flirting with it a couple handles away. So certainly for all the uh, energy bulls out there, it's been an interesting week, and of course we're starting to see uh, some some vol like we, like we mentioned on the show last week vol being exhibited out there actually this prolonged rally has taken some of it out we were talking last week about ovx and oiv hovering well into the 50s coming off that this week south of the 50 handle with oiv and others just a little bit south not talking 30s we're talking about 49 and a half or so but still a little bit coming off a little bit but still obviously a very very volatile time a very volatile week for all the people out there who are watching and, and playing in the crude um, you know, Matt and Mike, I know you guys pretty much specialize in volatility term structure. I, I know earlier this summer when you're looking at other products, uh, crude was certainly the place to look and the term structure was rocking and rolling out there. Have you had any time? I mean, obviously this week has been, <laughs> been pretty much focused on VIX, but uh, have you had any time recently to start maybe looking at uh, the, the crude? It could be WTI, it could be Brent, it could be both looking at the term structure out there in the futures and maybe starting to work on uh, some signals and some trading strategies for that product? Or are you just exclusively, uh, exclusively on vol right now? It's, so positions are exclusively you know equity vol but that being said cross asset vol is important to us in terms of uh you know kind of canaries in the coal mine you saw crude vol be a very crucial leading indicator of equity vol back in december uh as it rolled through the high yield market you know the cross asset stuff is definitely on our radar list all the time you know i'd throw you know, credit vol in there as well, whether it's uh, investment grade CDS, high yield CDS. Those are all things that we, we watch and monitor <clears throat> because it, they do flow through to uh, equity vol. And I think you saw FX vol, you know, commodity vol, and uh, fixed income vol spike this summer 
you know, June and July and finally show up in equities in August. So it's important uh, for us to watch, but we do not trade those products directly. So you use it more as a, of a leading indicator to perhaps indicate that a buy or sell signal will be lurking in your primary product uh, more than anything else, sounds like. Right. Interesting stuff. Yes, it has been interesting to watch a uh, crude. We could have, uh, for much of this year, just done a show on crude vol, and it would have been jam-packed to the gills uh, with both uh, developments in the market and, of course, people writing in with their questions and comments. Uh, crude taking a little bit of a backseat right now, but the product is not quiet, not by uh, a long shot, and there's uh, a lot to dive into there. But I think uh, before we dive even more into crude, I want to make sure uh, you guys over there get your time on the old volatility views panel. We've been kind of... Uh, been overlooking the questions a little bit of late, so I'll make sure you guys get some time. So without further ado, I think we're going to keep on rolling into my own personal favorite part of the show, the volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider all right everybody like the man said this is the portion of the program where you guys get to join us here on the volatility views show make your questions your comments known to us like he just listed no shortage of ways uh, for you guys to do just that starting off here uh, with a frequent listener frequent writer in or <laughs> frequent commenter mark Brandt, he writes in hey thanks uh, for sharing uh, the VIX one by two call swap, excuse me, roller trader on vol views and repeating it until we get it. A, a super great VIX strategy. Well, you're welcome there, Mark, and for everyone else who wrote in about that trade. And you know, it, it has been one we've been talking about a lot on the show, but it is interesting. A, it, it's ridiculously sizable in a year when until these last couple of weeks when VIX really wasn't doing a heck of a lot from the futures or the options perspective, this one whale was accounting for a significant portion uh, of the monthly volume in his one trade. So you couldn't avoid talking about it. You kind of had to talk about it. And in terms of, of setting up a decent longer term way to keep yourself at the table until VIX does what everyone wants it to do, which is that aggressive, some may say aberrant upside spike that everyone's looking to capture out there. That strategy wasn't a bad way to play it. He was, of course, selling one closer to somewhere around the at-the-money, sometimes a, usually a little bit above uh, the at-the-money, and then, of course, buying two farther out of the money. Uh, the width of the spread would vary depending on the month and how, the, how things were shaping up out there, how he could get it off with the best prices. Uh, but it was usually uh, not that wide, you know, probably somewhere in the three-to-five handle range. Uh, and it was a, a decent way, and he kept doing it, of course, started it back before the summer, has been rolling it every month, every month, every month, and doing all right, but some wins, some losses, nothing really to speak of. Of until, of course, uh, this past month when he was able to capture you know, all or a lot of that upside, we should say. And that was uh, an interesting one. So, yeah, if you have been looking for interesting strategies, granted, you're not going to do the same size, but it doesn't matter. You can still uh, take things and do one lots and one by two or 10 by 20, whatever floats your boat. And it is an interesting way to uh, perhaps view uh, the VIX. Mark, I know you were kind of a fan of this strategy as well. Of course, our, our one by two friend. Uh, who did pretty well over the past couple of weeks. So uh, is this is this one of your go-to uh, ways to structure out there in VIX, or do you have a, a different strategy you prefer? It's, it is a great go-to structure, the one-by-two. You know, you can argue about where to place the strikes, and it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and when. But, you know, that's it's definitely the most efficient way, I think, to hedge using, uh, using the, the VIX options. <laughs> Yeah, because I, mean, I use that illusion. I, I don't know, they don't like the gambling analogy, but I use that illusion to keeping yourself at the table long enough to win. And that certainly is the game, particularly in a product like VIX, because you're really waiting for those few, few moments a year when it really outperforms everything else. Uh, otherwise, VIX is all right, but when you have those days, those moments like last Monday and others, uh, that's when you're really hitting the home run. So if you can keep yourself in there long enough to get a few of those, uh, then uh, you're sitting pretty. And certainly that strategy seems uh, pretty well-primed to do just that. All right, moving on to a question. This comes from uh, from JG, and he writes, hey, is the interest in VIX options mostly institutional or is retail there too? Obviously, we were talking about VIX futures earlier, a lot of institutional interest in those. 
Well, those primarily an institutional product still probably because of the nature of the VIX of a future itself just seems to cater to that crowd more. But if, I think to me, if you look back on the last decade or so of options and the different developments we've seen in the marketplace and the surprises we've seen, you know, things like the really aggressive embrace of the weeklies surprised some people, you know, the death of minis, everyone thought that was going to be a home run. Uh, that surprised a lot of people, myself included. But I think for me, one of the biggest surprises I've seen uh, in the options business industry world, whatever it was, is the stunning embrace of retail of a product like VIX and particularly VIX options. I mean, when I, when they first told me, I think it was actually uh, uh, Stephen Brodsky at the time, who was the, the CEO of the Siebel at the time, was talking about they were planning to launch an actual tradable VIX future and then options on it. This is, I think, around 2004, so over 10 years ago now. And, uh, and I kind of laughed. I thought I said, well, that's that's nice. But, you know, who's going to trade that? But the the biggest of the big funds, I, I, I think I even said at the time, I said, I can't think of a more institutional product than this, because you're talking about the implied vol of the SPX. SPX is already an institutional product. And now you have taken the implied vol out of that. Who's going to be able to touch that? I also pity the poor market maker is going to try to make a market in this because you're providing a layoff pit for everyone else out there in the SPX pit to lay off all their vol. It seemed like just uh, had disaster written all over it. Fast forward a decade or so, and you have this product that has been just widely and, and roundly embraced by the retail trading public, rightly or wrongly, depending on your point of view, something people are getting in over their heads with a product that they don't understand. And there certainly is that argument to be made. But it's to me, that's been one of the more stunning things I've seen unfold in the marketplace is just how much retail love there is for the VIX product. Mark, I mean, how much how much of your of your mentoring business over there at Option Pit is based around active retail wanting to come in and learn about VIX? A, a large percentage of it, is it not? Yeah, there's a decent amount, although, it, you know, a lot of, you know, we, we're one of the few groups that I think still that does cater it. Some of the other guys are catching up, but, you know, I can remember, you know, you meet the, there's still a alarming number of people that think the underlying for VIX options is the futures. I don't know what <laughs> what's your guys' experience. I mean, you're you obviously have a lot of institutional you have an institutional audience, generally speaking, but you also do have some a lot of, you know, some QEPs that invest. I mean, what what is what does a your client profile look like? Yeah, I would say that there is still a large swath of people that do think the VIX index is the reference for IV on VIX options. It is clearly gaining in popularity. You know, I think there's uh, is looked at like free leverage, if you will, even something like VXX, when you hit it right, you don't even have to borrow money to, uh, you know, far outperform the S&P on a day, just because the nature of volatility is going to move far more than S&P. So I think, you know, it's it's used um, not with a lottery ticket mindset, but, you know, something pretty close to that. And I think the, the use of it or as the knowledge grows has become, you know, much more sophisticated even by the retail set. But like you said, the death of the mini VIX future contract kind of uh, speaks to the fact that it is heavily skewed towards institutional use uh, versus retail. Yeah, I'm not saying institutions don't institutions don't play out there. Clearly, they do, and they are the still the lion's share of the volume. No one else is going to be able to do something like that massive one million contract call one by two swap. That's clearly institutional paper. But just the fact that there's any appreciable percentage of retail out there in the VIX options to me is just mind blowing. I, I think I'll have to look. You know, for many years at Insider since we launched, the number one question we got from you know the the basic retail options guy was always something to do with the fact of skew, where you know you bought a call. And then it didn't go there. the underlying move their way and the call lost money. How is that possible? That's pretty much the number one call we or email we got. Uh, now it may have flipped. It may have flipped to exactly what you guys were just talking about. It may have flipped to uh, why are these VIX options so mispriced? Because they're all looking at the VIX cash. Uh, so I'll have, to, I'll have to do some research on that to get the numbers. But it may have usurped it, which, again, is a, another indicator that retail getting some serious penetration out there in uh, VIX options. All right. Good question there, Jay. Coming on another question. This one actually came came from you, Mark, from one of your webinar users. It was Peter R., so I'll let you have a uh, have, uh, pride of place on this one. He writes, hey, Mark, thanks for doing the free webinar. So there you go. Someone liked your webinar. He goes on to say, hey, trying to educate myself regarding the VIX. Please answer why, if there was backwardation in the VIX term structure, why is the VXX not trading close to three times higher than the VIX? Thank you. Well, this is your question, Mr. Sebas. It came for you, so have at it, sir. Well, I, you know, and, and the, the thing that I think this user misunderstands is that, you know, VXX 
it, you know, it, it, it's tracking a 30-day VIX future, not the VIX itself. And yes, it's starting to gain value, but when we're in a contango, it has this this whole drawdown of assets, and then over time, it it you know once we flip, right now is really the VX is its first time in you know what a year since it had an opportunity to gain any money, and this is the longest period since eleven that you know prior to other since two thousand eleven, Matt. When's the last time that we had more than a week where VXX actually had the wind to its back? I mean, is that it? Is uh, that never since 2011 until now. This is the first time. Yeah. So you got v- VXX is coming from such a negative place that, you know, in order for it to get to three times VIX, we would need the VIX to sit sit in this range or really kind of has to keep creeping higher. Right. And the future is to just kind of follow that, Matt. So how, how does VXX, what, what's the process, Matt or Mike, whoever, um, Matt, who's sitting here uh, for VXX to get to 90. 90, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll need uh, the curve to stay backward, number one, which is um, already happening, and then you're going to need to see it lift at the same time, so you have the double wind at the back of VXX. So um, I think what happens, well, what does happen in backwardation is uh, the the decay that VIX, VXX normally has turns into an anti-decay, and so all else equal, you know, VIX goes flat, VXX ought to drift a little higher on that day doesn't make it um, doesn't increase the delta or the beta to VIX at all um, it just kind of puts a, a gentle or not so gentle wind at its back so you know typically VXX ought to trade about 50 to 60 percent of the movement of spot VIX every day and that's that's during contango or backwardation what backwardation gives you is you know on those days when VIX is flat or even down VXX can still um, kind of keep chugging so, you know, the, the, what you need to understand is that it's not a, uh, you know, it, the VIX, VXX does not track VIX. It tracks an index that is a 30-day future. Uh, what's, the, what's the index that VXX tracks called? The S&P 500 Short-Term VIX Futures Index. So if you want to look at, at, at really what VXX should look like, that's its index, not VIX itself. And that's why it's not trading it three times. Yeah, a lot to unpack there in that question. I, well, I can say uh, anecdotally over, over the anecdotally over the past week or so, uh, we uh, we had the temerity to post a, a BXX unusual activity uh, report on the site alert without the strike. We've never had so much uh, irate email coming from and, and Facebook questions and Twitter and our website, everyone writing in saying, what was the strike? So clearly, just anecdotally listening to what you guys are, are up in arms about, clearly a lot of interest right now in VXX and how it's performing. So first off, we learned, A, we'll never do that again. We won't post one on the, certainly without the strike, certainly not in VXX. That apparently is is everyone's baby right now. Kind of remind me if you had the, had the temerity mark of maybe slamming Apple a couple of years ago, the kind of response oh, you would get. Uh, and yeah. yeah, people just up in arms. How dare we not put all the information out there about VXX? So clearly VXX, a top of mind for a lot of people. And you're right. We're always talking about VXX just being this long, sn- slow death march of a product. And all you do is buy longer term puts and kind of sit on them and forget about it. And how often do you get, like you said, how often do you get a moment where that isn't the case? Very, very infrequently. <laughs> I was telling uh, Sebastian this morning, I saw for the first time ever, someone put up a decent size VXX uh, risk rever- reversal in November, selling puts to buy calls. <laughs> Is that the first time it's ever happened? <laughs> it's, the first, it's the first time I've ever seen it. Is that the uh, first call bid that's ever happened in, in VXX history? Yeah, yeah. So it, it was uh, it's like a unicorn sighting. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, there you go, listeners, all the people out there who are asking and wondering about VXX. That should that should sum it all up for you right there, the way that product normally trades versus this kind of brief aberration we're seeing right now. And, yeah, a, a bullish risk reversal in VXX. That is that's a unicorn if ever I've seen one out in the in the volatility world. All right, great questions, everybody. Keep them coming. Uh, meanwhile, it's time for us to keep on rolling into our final segment. It's time for the breakout The crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. 
All right, everybody, welcome to the Crystal Ball. This is the portion of the program where we prognosticate recklessly and sometimes wildly, like we did last show, about the uh, what the future holds from a volatility perspective. Uh, I'll, le- I'll let you Typhon brothers, Typhon bros, go first uh, with uh, with your, since you are the guest, you get pride of place. Mark and I were kind of a little bit wild and wooly last week, kind of going out on a limb saying, yeah, I think there might be a little bit more a little bit more vol to come before it settles off inevitably back down into the mid or low teens. And that is exactly what we're seeing right now as the show is coming to a close. Listeners, uh, the Bix Cash hovering right around 29, up about three and a quarter handles or so. So up another about half a point since we started the show. Uh, the sell-off still hovering about 1.7% down in the S&P. Uh, the Dow looking closer to 2%, though. So it is still... Any question as to whether this sell-off will continue today or ameliorate going into the end of the day? Uh, so I'll put you guys on the spot first, you guys from Typhon. Uh, what's your what's your guess for the week to come? And also maybe give us a little bit of your guess for uh, the VIX futures term structure, because that is your baby. You think it's going to stay as, as crazy as it is now, or it may start to flatten out? First of all, I think... Uh Looking at the long weekend here, we think about a buck thirty goes back into spot on Tuesday. So, just a technical thing. But uh, with, with generally, when the VIX you know, spikes above thirty, it typically doesn't uh, you know crash back down. So our operating thesis is that it's sort of a higher floor on it's now for the foreseeable future and at least realize comes down. You know that being said, uh, even support a thirty-two VIX. S&P's got to trade in two percent ranges, so it's a bit of a high bar just to maintain a thirty-two. And I, I don't think the uh, the curve the term structure is is going to do is going to go back to contango anytime soon. It's generally a month to three month kind of healing process, if you will, where the uh, post traumatic stress syndrome of uh, you know, sharp equity sell off moves its way through market psychology. Next week, you know, kind of the macro view, view front. We're looking to see if the U.S. does uh, impose sanctions to China for that hacking uh, scandal. And then really what we get ball moving is if China responds by selling more treasuries and maybe a, a renewed or abrupt devaluation of the yuan. <clears throat> so it's kind of on our, uh, on our radar to see you know, that specific uh, event risk is out there. So I think vol is in a sort of a higher band, call it you know, 16 maybe is the new floor. And, uh, you know, kind of 32 is the new maybe sort of spot trading range with some uh, some <clears throat> ex- exploration above that level every now and then. Yeah. I think if, if we're crystal balling it here, uh, I'm going to say that this I'm applying the August 2011 template to this. Um, so I think the curve stays backward through probably Thanksgiving ish, uh, maybe, you know, earlier. Um, and we probably see another trip back in the low 40s for for spot VIX. And, uh, you know, maybe a rally towards the end of the year. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see VXX up on the year. Wow, interesting. Backward all the way through Thanksgiving. That would indeed be uh, an interesting couple of months to unfold. And on a side note, you guys are just full of the of the pearls of, of wisdom, the nuggets today. You have, I think you had VIX conflagration earlier in the show. Now you're throwing out VIX fix post post traumatic stress syndrome uh that's uh, all sorts of good terms we may have to borrow here on the show going forward i like it hey uh, yeah feel free to use v- vtsd yeah vtsd uh, <laughs> i love so, it uh, yeah and i i tend to be on board with them I, I i don't think there's there uh there's much i would disagree with there i'll have to wait and see but certainly a lot of uh, a lot of argument for the term structure perhaps staying the way it is uh, for the foreseeable future, I think good point too about the upside band coming in the low in the low thirties. A lot of people, I think, had a bit of an awakening. People who are always out there and writing into this show and others uh, saying, "Hey, what about you know making these crazy trades, buying VIX 50, 60, 70 calls, and crazy things like that?" We see that going up all the time. And you know, a day like Monday of last week, where the floor is falling out of the market and the VIX came up, cash got up to about a low 50s. I think that opened a lot of people's eyes to just see exactly what it takes just to get up to that even aberrant level, let alone some of the ridiculous levels we've seen before. Uh, so hopefully that'll give people a little bit better frame of reference going forward as to what a, something even as elevated as the 30s, what that means and what that means for the market to sustain that over the long term. Uh, good stuff. We have to cut it short there. Unfortunately, listeners, this was a great episode. I think a lot more for us to discuss in future episodes about all this fun unfolding there in the VIX term structure and all these other products out there, BXX, XIV, et cetera, et cetera. 
a lot to analyze. But before we wrap it up, as always, let me check back in with each of my cohorts here. And starting off with our guests, the uh, boys from Typhon Capital Management. Uh, what can our listeners expect from you guys coming down the pike, and where should they go to learn more about what you guys are up to over there at Typhon? Uh, we can go to uh, our website's typhoncap.com, T-Y-P-H-O-N, typhoncap.com. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Dynamic Ball, and Mike's is at Mike T. <laughs> One, two, seven, three. There you go. Follow him on Twitter if you want some nuggets of volatility wisdom. And don't make a mistake, it's not Typhoon Capital. It is Typhon with one O. Uh, so don't, I'm not sure where that other link takes you, but don't go there. Go to Typhon Capital instead. All right, and Mr. Sebastian had to run, but of course, you guys know where to find him. Surf on over to optionpit.com to learn more. And on behalf of Mark and, of course, the boys over there at Typhon Capital Management and, indeed, myself, I want to thank everyone out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show and, of course, for sending in such great questions. We love them. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next time right here on Volatility Views. Thank you for listening to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. For episode archives and detailed show notes, please visit theoptionsinsider.com slash volatilityviews. Be sure to make your own voice heard by leaving a volatility voicemail at 773-669-4VOL or by posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. Volatility Views is brought to you by Russell Investments, a global asset manager and one of only a few firms that offer actively managed multi-asset portfolios and services that include advice, investments, and implementation. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.